We might be racing the daylight again. It just happens every time. It just gets so dark so early now. All of a sudden it's like four o'clock and I haven't filmed yet, so. Here's Sunday, since we just turned the camera on as per usual. She's a creature of habit, you know? Are you gonna be right in frame this time? Not really. <laughs> Today we're talking about my November wrap up and oh my God, I read 14 books, which is ridiculous. I think that's the best month that I've had like numbers wise since I restarted this booktube channel. I think I read like 10 or 11 in August and I'm really proud of myself. The The game changer was listening to like way more audiobooks. I just listened to audiobooks like in my car, cleaning my house, um, and working in Photoshop. Like audiobooks are the way to go. So first of all, the first book that I read was A Torch Against the Night by Saba Tahir. I read this like the first couple days of November because I wanted to catch up in order to catch the live show for Ember Along since this was the book that they read in October and I didn't get to it in October. So I squeezed this in. This was a reread for me, but it was just as good and just as powerful as I remember it. This is the second in the series. Um, I gave it five stars and then later in the month, I picked up A Reaper at the Gates for the first time. I hadn't actually read this yet. And this book destroyed me, like in the best way. Um, but I, I was like fully, physically and emotionally wrecked after finishing this book and it just makes me really excited and really like terrified to read A Sky Beyond the Storm in December which is the final book that just came out on the 1st of December. I literally have not been so excited for the conclusion of a series since the release of Deathly Hallows like a million years ago. So stoked for this. This is obviously the second and third in the series by Saba Tahir. If you have never read the Ember and the Ashes series, like now is the time to get on the bandwagon. Both of these were like an easy peasy five stars for me. I think Reaper is probably my new favorite in the series. Although I will say that I think Torch gets a lot of um, kind of a bad rap for no good reason. I don't really know why. It's just very like dark. A lot of things happen. All of the characters really kind of battle their demons in this book. I really loved it. You get to see a lot of how the story ends up scaling um, at, for like the setup for the next couple of books. And then Reaper is where like, everything kind of goes to shit and all of those um, setups, all of those conflicts really come to a head. And it's like, in many ways, it's the point of no return for a lot of the characters like arcs. Um, not that there was like an opportunity for them to turn back and go back to their normal lives before this book. That's definitely not the case. Like they're fully in it by this book, but this book, like I felt like the characters really grew into themselves and really like grew into their potential in the third book. I was really confident that I had guessed the twist, which is fine. Like I, I feel like that's a sign of really good writing if you're able to be picking up hints and breadcrumbs throughout the book. I know that some people, um, really dislike when they're able to guess a twist. But I find that really fun. So I thought I was really excited, feeling all good about myself that I had guessed the ending and then I sure had not guessed the ending. So I was like surprised times two because I had been like so confident that I had just prepared myself for the twist that I was sure was the ending um, and it was not anything close to what I thought it was. So. I literally love this series. Both of these books were five stars. The first book was also five stars and I'm really excited to read A Sky Beyond the Storm later this month. So if I don't stop gushing now, I'll just ramble forever. So I'm gonna put these down, but seriously, one of my favorite series ever. And then um, after that, my hold came through the library for The Kingdom of Back by Marie Lu. This was such a cool book. I'm slowly trying to work my way through Marie Lu's backlist, which I, the only books that I've read by her are the Legend Trilogy, like forever ago, and now The Kingdom of Back. I'm going to read Warcross like over the weekend, probably. Um, I just think she's a really great writer. I remember when I read the Legend Trilogy that I just really admired her like writing style. It's just very action packed, but it doesn't feel like you're going at the speed of light. It just feels very like immersive and lovely and like masterfully crafted. And I love the way that she really gets into her characters' heads and 
the kingdom of back was no different this is such a unique and interesting premise uh it's basically like the fictionalized imagined childhood of nanarl mozart who is wolfgang mozart's older sister and she was allegedly like equally as talented and just as much of a prodigy as her brother was in music but because of the time period that they lived in like women weren't really supposed to take that role it was like okay for her to be a child prodigy to play with him like to play music with him but she was definitely it would have been really taboo if she would have like composed or published any um works of music of her own like with her own name this book is a very cool like speculative magical realism book for kids and also historical fiction but it's like young adult and I, it doesn't really feel like young adult. It really felt like more middle grade. If you don't read middle grade or young adult, I think that you would still like this book. They just happen to be kids. Like the characters just happen to be kids. It didn't really feel like a juvenile read, if that makes sense. There are definitely like magical speculative elements to this book that have to do with Nanarl's fear of being forgotten or like history not remembering her and not doing her justice even though she is just as talented as her brother whom she loves more than anything. I really really loved the sibling dynamics in this book. I, because I have two younger brothers I never feel seen by a lot of sibling dynamics that I read. It's just like never feels realistic and I really related to the sibling dynamics in this book in particular. I just really felt for Nanarl. I really loved like the interesting combo of historical fiction, speculative fiction, and like a sprinkle of magical realism as well with the music and historical figure. Really good. Gave this a four stars just because like I simply wanted more and sometimes I there were moments where I felt like it got a little lost in the sauce of like the the kind of magical elements but that also was kind of the point because there are moments where Nanarl is feeling like really lost and confused and so she's kind of like wandering in this like dreamscape or magical like element that you're not really sure is she making it up is it really happening so there's some really great twists in this book as well and Overall, definitely worth your time and the audiobook was wonderful. We might be here for a while because I read a lot of really good books and I just could go on and on about them. So it might just be a theme on my channel that I have really long wrap ups and honestly, like <laughs> I'm okay with that because I'm the schmuck that has to edit this anyways. So <laughs> I hope you're sticking around. The next audiobook that I read was The Beekeeper of Aleppo by Christy Lefteri. And this was also an excellent audiobook. This was a winner of the 2018 Aspen Words Literary Prize, which is an award that goes to a book that has like an impact or a commentary on an important social issue, like globally, domestically, uh, etc. And I really love like following the winners in the shortlist of this prize. And this was the winner a couple years ago for very good reason. The story follows um, two Syrian refugees fleeing from their hometown of Aleppo and takes them through like the trials and the grief and the trauma of what that entails and the war that's going on in their hometown, what causes them to flee, their family members that they have lost or that they have lost touch with or that have died because of the terrible tragedies going on in their like beloved home city that they can no longer call home because it's been so wrapped by war. It's not based on a true story but the author says in the acknowledgments that she was volunteering in the area and some of the characters are loosely based on some of the people that she met during her time volunteering. This book follows Nuri who is an, a beekeeper or he was a beekeeper when they were living happily in Aleppo and his wife Afra who is blind. So you follow the two of them leaving Aleppo and all of the trials that it takes to try and get them to the UK where they have friends and family waiting for them there. It's really hard for me to like do this book justice talking about it because like simply I can't explain how powerful this book is. There are some like huge twists in this book that I won't hint at remotely because that's part of the reading experience. What I will say is that this book like tackles grief, hope, sorrow, war, family, tragedy in the most incredible, powerful, beautiful, real, raw way. 
and I was like weeping at the end of this book and not because it like emotionally broke me but it was just it felt so real like I really felt like I was walking with Afra and Nuri through their journeys and through um all of the horrors that they faced I I really can't express like how thoroughly I enjoyed and felt for this book and it just made me want to read something more like it and research more into like the Syrian refugee crisis because it really truly was absolutely a masterpiece. Look, I've got through like four books and the light is already going, so I'm gonna try and speed it up a little bit. <laughs> then I read Citizen 13660 by Mine Okubo. I literally read this in like one sitting. It's really brief because it's like 200 pages, but the pages are like a paragraph each and they're illustrated by the author. And this follows this woman's experience in these like Japanese concentration camps after Pearl Harbor when all people, whether they were born in Japan or born in the United States or otherwise, like regardless of all people of Japanese descent were like rounded up into protective custody. It's really gnarly. There's a lot of like hope in this book, but it also, she says in the foreword that this book is like um, referenced as a, like a real account in courtrooms and um, like history classes about what it was like in these camps because they weren't allowed to have cameras or anything because they were worried that they would contain like spyware. So she sketched everything. So all of her sketches in here she made during her stay and all of her like journal entries and everything and she even explains toward the end that after like after all of the craziness she could have or she felt like she should have left the camp sooner than she did but she was just trying to finish the last of her sketches for this book that she wanted to write and it's really wonderful it's I learned so much like I literally had no idea um like the complexity and the depth that went on like during this whole like fiasco and it was just really interesting to read about how like the people came together how they like leaned on each other in these moments and yet how it still was like so unideal and just like the most unbelievable experience so th this was really cool and I don't rate memoirs like this but it, it was awesome and after that I picked up I am Malala again I started this over the summer and kind of like accidentally put it down for no good reason because it was it was excellent like it was so good and then I actually got the audiobook from the library so I finished this listening to the audiobook instead of like physically reading it but it was just like I can't express how moving this really was and Malala is like my idol. If you asked me who would you want to have dinner with in the entire world like dead or living I hands down I would say Malala like I have so much to learn from her I think everyone could stand to learn from her she's just such a kind and wise and intelligent spirit. This was so potent and real and just like wise beyond her years absolutely incredible the story of Malala if you don't know is that her father is a school teacher and runs multiple schools for kids in her home of Pakistan in the Swat Valley in Pakistan and her father is really outspoken about education and rights of the people in the in that country so Malala grows up listening to him and speaking with him and she goes to his schools and around the time that she's a teenager the Taliban decides that girls aren't supposed to go to school so her and her father become really outspoken become like very well known in the country for speaking out against like the Taliban's views and her and her father say no girls absolutely deserve education and uh, eventually the Taliban tracks her down and shoots her in the head and she survives be and writes this it, unbelievably incredible memoir. The next audiobook that I listened to was A Very Large Expansive Sea by Tahira Mafi. I was really surprised by how much I love this book because I did read mm, the first couple books in her Shatter Me series like years ago and I thought they were just okay but this book like th this should be reading like for everyone this was so good and that means a lot coming from me because usually I like just hate 
books set in high school like no matter what it, it just really does not work for me i just do not like the high school setting and this book is like exclusively set in high school but i think it worked for me because the main character is so cool and lovable and complex and like wonderful so i didn't mind about the high school setting at all because i was just so wrapped up in the main character and how much I loved her. This follows Shireen who is a high school girl and she's used to moving from school to school to school because her parents are always moving for their jobs and it's shortly after the events of 9-11 and she's still wearing her headscarf because that's what makes her comfortable and she likes wearing her headscarf and uh, she gets a lot of unwanted comments, a lot of hate and prejudice thrown her way because of it and because of the way she looks and who she is and so she is like this really cool and snarky badass teenager and she accidentally finds this like white boy who wants to learn more about her and they become friends and then more things happen and it's just so good. I really was surprised by this book. I read it in one day and it was awesome. Five stars. And then I did a 24 hour readathon and that vlog will be going up over the weekend, I think. But here's what I read for the 24 hour readathon. I read The Witches of Brooklyn, which is a middle grade graphic novel. Black Imagination, which is a curated anthology by a bunch of different black collaborators. An Absolutely Remarkable Thing by Hank Green, and I finished Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, which is a nonfiction book about indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teachings of plants. So here are my thoughts. <laughs> Witches of Brooklyn was really cute. Uh, it's this really like whimsical and fun story about this girl who shows up at her aunt's house, and her aunt and her partner are both witches but she kind of accidentally discovers that. It's really cute. I just did really did not leave much of an impression on me. I think there is a sequel, so I may read the sequel. Sometimes graphic novels, in my experience, like take one or two or three volumes to really like find their groove. So I may continue with this. I really liked the concept of this, like these two sweet old ladies, like just doing witch stuff in, in New York. And um, it was awesome. So I gave it three stars. And we'll see if I continue with the series, but yeah, it was fun. Black Imagination, this book was so cool. And rather than like project onto this book, I'm just gonna read you a paragraph from the foreword that I think really sums this up perfectly. This says, we know how we exist in the white imagination, but this book is not about that, about constantly correcting ourselves, tiptoeing around and placating whiteness. It's about saying and doing what we need and want to imagine and heal. Black imagination is a reclamation of our bodies, space, intelligence, care, and joy. Black imagination is a reclamation of our whole damn selves. It's connection and kinship, a celebration of us. But don't think for one minute that black imagination is easy. As you will read here, it is hard earned and sometimes dangerous, but it's necessary and radical to claim and work towards. Listening to my people in this book gave me so much life and I'm pretty sure, dear reader, you are in for the same. So I don't want to like speak about what I thought about this book other than to say that I'm really so glad that I had the opportunity to read this because I really enjoyed the experience of like, absorbing and learning and enjoying these stories and I would recommend this to anyone who wants to do the same. The next I read An Absolutely Remarkable Thing by Hank Green and I actually read this on audiobook form but this was a really interesting and very accessible and hilarious like foray into science fiction aliens. <laughs> I was pretty sure I was gonna like this. This was in my five star predictions and I actually gave it five stars, which is like one of the first in the predictions list that that's actually happened for, I think. But this was so cool. This follows April May, who is just a 20 something like graphic designer and she stumbles across this weird metal sculpture after work one day, takes a funny video of it and posts it on the internet and then overnight becomes this like instant celebrity because those exact same sculptures popped up in like dozens of cities across the world at the exact same time with no explanation. And so she was just the first person to make a viral video of it and finds herself like an accidental viral star. And so it follows her as like 
her, with the, the, all of this newfound fame and also like what the hell's going on with these like weird alien sculpture things so cool i was not expecting it to be so funny like listening to this audiobook was so fun because i just like was laughing out loud to myself alone in my house and the dog was looking at me like what's so funny if you don't think that you're a science fiction reader i would challenge you to read this because it's not super sciencey and even the parts that are vaguely sciencey are really really funny and easy to read so it's definitely worth it i'm very excited to read the second book and uh yeah this was great and then braiding sweet grass this was really cool i've been reading this for a long time like a couple months because like this is not a book to be rushed this is very dense but in like the absolute best way it's like truly beautiful poetic writing and um layered in with like her memories her lessons her teachings that she's learned from elders and from like other members in her community and in her family and she also is like a botanist and a professor. And so she is layering in all of this knowledge on top of their myths and legends and beliefs with like the science and the plants and what we know about both and where science and like indigenous wisdom intersects. And it's just like so beautiful. I, I don't know how else to describe this book. This is a book to be like treasured and slowly absorbed. This is a book that I think I will reread like many times in many years to come because I can tell that because it was like so dense in like the most beautiful way that I will pick up like new things every time I read it. So I'm really excited. I'm really happy that I got to read this and love this. Five stars for sure, like 10 stars if I could. Wait, I'm actually almost done. Okay, we're, we're gonna make it, we're gonna make it. Next, I read The Heart's Invisible Furies by John Boyne. This was one of my friend's picks for our like girlfriend's Zoom book club that we do every month. And this was really interesting. This was not a book that I would have picked up for myself. And if this wasn't for a book club, I think I would have DNF'd this. This is like a 600 page chunk of a book. I actually listened to this on audiobook too. I just happened to have like physical copies of these because <laughs> all of my holds came through from the library this month. It was awesome. I really enjoyed the audiobook of this because this does take place in Ireland for most of the book. And so the narrator has an Irish accent, which was really fun. <laughs> but I also thought that he just did a good job of um, bringing life into a lot of these characters because if I'm being completely honest, I did not feel like the main character was very developed. Like we follow his entire life in this book, which was really cool. I haven't read a book like that ever, maybe. Um, like literally his mother gives birth to him and through like a bunch of time jumps, we follow him like until he dies and it's very cool. But that being said, like I feel like I should have like been in his head a little bit more. I liked all of the side characters way more than I liked the main character, but this is really deserving of all of the awards that it has received. This is also, I think this also won an Aspen Literary Award, or it was at least shortlisted. This has also won or been nominated for a bunch of awards in like LGBTQ award spheres, um, because like this follows the story of a young man in like 1960s, 70s, 80s Ireland, who realizes he's gay when it's still like incredibly taboo in that country at that time. So he moves around a lot and has a lot of different experiences and we really get to see him grow um, in his like sexuality and his confidence as he gets older. And that part was really cool. But as far as his like personality goes, I, I don't feel like I got much out of him. So worth the read. Don't think I'd, or I'd read it again but I'm glad that this was like picked for a book club. I gave this three stars. And then you guys are gonna laugh because I'm gonna hold the book up, but I also primarily read this on audiobook. <laughs> um, this is The Radium Girls by Kate Moore. I read this like half and half. The first half of this I read physically. My best friend from college sent this to me for my birthday, which was like 
three months ago. So I'm sorry, Amy, but I did read it and I did love it. So thank you. <laughs> this was awesome. Like this was so good. Everyone has talked about this book recently, but I think that this is going to be my next go-to recommendation for people who don't read nonfiction but want to read nonfiction because this is a nonfiction book, but it just, it reads like any thriller. Um, it's really dark. It makes me really angry to think about, but it was very good and very compelling and very interesting and very well researched, but like not overly like dense or like boring to like slog through. Like it's definitely a page turner. Like I could not put this down. The story of the Radium Girls is based on these women in the 1920s who are working in radium dial factories where they are painting watch faces with radium paint because the paint glows in the dark. So they're painting the numbers on the watches for primarily for like soldiers and military reasons during the war so that the watches and stuff will glow in the dark. So these radium painters, as they are instructed by their superiors when they are trained in the factory, they dip their paintbrush in the paint, which contains radium, and then they're taught to put the paintbrush into their mouth so that they can point the bristles of the brush so that it's thin enough to trace the numbers on the watch faces. And they're told that's just how we do it. It's not dangerous. It won't hurt you. In fact, you'll be healthier because of it. And then unsurprisingly, uh, they start to get sick and that's the story. And it's very anger inducing but very good. And I'm very glad that this work exists because this is like justice for these women that went through this and like fought for their own rights and their own health. And a lot of what goes on, goes on to like become the foundation for um, protecting workers against like unsafe workplace conditions basically. So this was literally so fascinating, but it made me so mad. Like um, my boyfriend was in the house while I was listening to this a lot and I was just like moaning and groaning and like shaking my fist and he was like, are you okay? Um, yes, but this book did hurt me. I gave this four stars, even though I like really, really loved it just because I wish that I would have gotten a little bit more out of the characters, which is kind of an unfair judgment because the characters are like, purely based on research and the author like didn't really want to take any liberties by like making assumptions about them. So the parts where she does express like, oh, so-and-so was wearing this outfit or so-and-so did this motion is based on like a few photographs or like journal entries that they, that they like still have after the decades. So I get it, but I just would have liked like a little bit more detail of like the women in this story. That That's really my only complaint. So it really could be a five star. I'm just being picky because I loved it so much. <laughs> Hello, editing Noelle here. And I realized that I forgot to mention the book that I DNF'd this month because like it was that forgettable. Um, I got about 60% through the proposal which is by the same author who wrote The Wedding Date, I think, and mm, DNF'd it. I didn't like it at all. Nothing happens in this book. And please tell me if that's just a thing with romance, but like there was no conflict. This just was like butterflies and unicorns. I didn't understand why it was called The Proposal because that scene happens in like the first few pages. And then the rest of the book that I read was like, literally like just casually dating this guy but like there's no the only conflict was oh no what if he thinks I want something serious oh no what if she thinks I want something serious and I just was like really bored and it was so forgettable um there was a couple cool things in this book that I liked like this talked a lot about like health women's health and like women's self-defense. They take like a uh, women's self-defense class in it, which I thought was like cool to see in like a contemporary like romance like this, but like overall like, yeah, no, I, this lost me. <laughs>
not worth my time in my opinion. Okay, the last one I actually haven't finished yet, but I'm like finishing it tonight because it was in my nonfiction November TBR. That is Women of Words, which is another anthology that is curated by Janet Bukovinsky teacher. And I've talked about this a couple times on my channel, but I, now that I have mostly read it, I was really surprised actually. I thought that this was gonna be like dated, but it really isn't. This is like super feminist in the biographies that the curator has written and the excerpts that she's chosen for each of the women writers are like still like so on point with like what's going on and important classics and important like works of fiction and like works of writing and essays that are still being talked about today. And I really loved it. I like bookmarked plenty of writers in here that I want to read more of and learn more about. Like for example, I had no idea that Mary Shelley who wrote Frankenstein and is credited as like the mother of science fiction, her mother, um, Mary Wollstonecraft was also a writer, maybe like the first Western feminist writer in the 1700s before Jane Austen, but she, it wasn't quite like her time yet. And so she's not really as remembered. And she died like right after giving birth to Mary Shelley. So even though both of them are like remembered and credited as like these pioneers in their genres as like women writers, neither of them like knew each other in life. What? I think I explained it, but this follows like 35 classic women writers, gives you a little biography of them, gives you an excerpt of two, uh, an excerpt or two of some of their like best work according to the curator. And then there's a really cool like colored pencil sketch headshot of each of them. This was really cool. I think I have maybe six more to read tonight. Really love this. This is gonna be a five star. Wow, okay, it's starting to get a little darker in here, but we made it, we did it. That is my very long, very wordy, enthusiastic wrap up for the month of November. Let's see if I can pick all these up because I don't really trust myself, but I'll do it, I'll do it for the fans. This is scary. <laughs> okay, so, you know, if I don't drop these, this is what I read with the exception of like a few more audiobooks and I am so impressed with myself. Like looking at this frame, this is a ridiculous amount of books to read. And I'm really not someone that will ever say, oh, I, I read so many books this month or oh, I only read this many books this month because I think that's kind of toxic on booktube to be honest. But personally, like for me, this was a very productive reading month for me and I'm proud of myself. <laughs> if you've made it this far in this very long video, please leave me a sunshine emoji so that I know that you watched this whole video. Thank you so much. I know this was a long one. I can't wait to buckle down and edit this monster, but I hope that you enjoyed all of these reviews. Please let me know if you've read any of these because I had a pretty good month and I would be happy to like discuss any of these with other people that have read them. That's, you know, that's the point of this platform. So let me know, hit me up and you know, YouTube things. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it or subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet and feel free to follow me on Instagram, Goodreads or Twitter if you so desire. I think I'm most active on Instagram these days. So again, thank you for watching and I will see you for my 24 hour readathon vlog next, I think. Okay, love you, bye. <laughs>